we should proceed. Everyone's here. We've got the materials. We're going to be on video. Um, we're not going to be taking a vote. Have the public comments now rather than later. Maybe that's all the motion. She's suggesting it. But I don't think anyone's. Eval's, I mean, if we look at who's on facilities, Eval and Brian are coming, and Artie and I are on facilities. So that's it from facilities, and no one else is coming from curriculum. So we're, we're not, Brian said, you know, it might be as long as two hours until he can be, he be relieved by his wife. So. But I mean, the people that came in that want to speak, at least let them speak, and get that over with. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, our, our powerhouses are here. Let's. Let's hear this and let's get going and let's get it on video and let's get it online and get the information disseminated. Okay. Thanks. Should we get started? Yes, please. Okay. Um, well, I want to welcome everyone who is uh, who's here tonight. And there will be public comment at the end of the presentation and we'll try to keep the presentation as short as, poss short as possible so we can hear that. Uh, obviously, we're disappointed in um, attendance uh, by Board of Education members tonight, but um, we will be taping uh, the meeting, so it will be available to anyone who uh, wants to look at it uh, that way. Uh, I want to thank Dr. Kimmel for being here, as well as um, Irving Kinsimis and, and Mr. Barbas, who respectively are the chairs of the Curriculum and um, uh, Facilities Committee. Um, I want to start by clarifying some potential confusion around needing a curriculum plan for each new school before uh, ed specs for the building can be developed. Uh, that is not correct. Uh, first, um, uh, all programs would follow uh, the Common Core Standards and the curriculum that we develop relative to uh, the Common Core Standards, with the exception of IB, which follows a um, um, widely accepted international uh, curriculum, uh, accepted by the industrialized uh, countries of the world. In terms of the ed specs, before they are developed, the board has to determine just three things. The size of the school, that is what the enrollment would, will be, how, much, how big it's going to be. The grade levels served, um, so you know how the school, the fixtures of the school uh, are to be sized. And finally, the general program or purpose of the school, um, which is why we've made program recommendations. Uh, so the ed spec specified the number of classrooms, um, size to the ages of the students, and any special features that the, of the facility necessary in terms of program design. Now, for example, you would have different features in a school for the arts as you, than you would in a STEM school, for, for example. Um, so, uh, delving into program design is what the subject of tonight's uh, meeting is, and we have two objectives. Um, first is to unpack the models for magnet schools that have been recommended. And, um, I would, you know, just remind everyone that the models, these models need to be robust enough uh, to elevate the education of children in the neighborhood who will be attending, as well as to attract families from other parts of the city to achieve racial balance. Uh, second, our second objective tonight is to examine in further detail where certain program designs may fit best uh, in the building program and why. So. Uh, with the first objective in mind, uh, we're going to uh, ask doc Dr. Connor and uh, Mr. Medard Thomas, the principal of Columbus Magnet, is going to assist him um, to um, uh, review um, the uh, program models, beginning with uh, the progressive model that we have referred to in uh, Norwalk as the Bank Street uh, school model. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Dr. Admas. First. To clarify a misconception is that many people have contextualized the Bank Street model. In reality, it's called the Progressive model. Um, the genesis of the Progressive model started with the dissatisfaction of traditional education that was in New York City, and a group of educators developed the Progressive model on Bank Street. So that was pretty much the conception of uh, the Bank Street or the Progressive model with that. So. The mission overall within the progressive model is a children's first um, mission with a hands-on experiential learning experience. So 
I'm going to have uh, Mr. Majority Thomas, who's the principal of Columbus, identify the specific characteristics as well as the program pragmatics of the progressive model. Thank you very much, Dr. Connor, uh, Dr. Adamowski, Mr. Barbas, Pastor Hardy, um, Mr. Kimmel. Uh, it's a privilege to be here, and um, I'd like to first of all share a little personal background information on myself. I am Medard Thomas, principal of proud principal of Columbus Magnet School, and I moved here nine years ago to in Norwalk. And when I moved here, I <coughs> looked at the schools and looked at Columbus Magnet School, and I said to myself, "Wow, I would love to be the principal of this school one of these days, but it'll never happen because." It'll never happen. And fast forward nine years later, here I am. I still have to pinch myself because I cannot believe I'm a Columbus Magnet. Um, this is not just a job for me, it's personal. Because I grew up on the Upper West Side. I grew up two blocks away from Bank Street College of Education. Um, Bank Street is in my blood. My mother worked at the Bank Street Library for 34 years before she retired last year. My very first job was at Bank Street College of Education at the library, where I worked um, shelving books um, every single weekend. And um, I was privileged enough to attend Bank Street for, and I received my master's education, my master's in elementary education from Bank Street. And so um, I'm not just the principal, but I really do understand the program, I understand the model, and I am, it's, it's a privilege to be there. Um, growing up in the Upper West Side, Bank Street was the, is still the hot place. It is the place where parents are clamoring to send their children every single day. It's almost like a blood sport. Um, Bank Street follows a progressive pedagogy, as Dr. Connor had stated, um, and you find different progressive schools in New York City. There's the Calhoun School, for example, where they charge upwards to $50,000 a year and they can fill seats in a matter of seconds because people just believe in the progressive model. There are a myriad of other schools that follow the progressive model as well, but um, to have a progressive school here in Connecticut, to be a pioneer of the progressive model here in Connecticut would be an unbelievable thing. Um, we at Columbus Magnet School we were Columbus School when we reopened as Columbus Magnet 35 years ago, and we adopted the Bank Street curriculum. And we have been a very successful magnet for 35, 36 years, and we plan on continuing doing what we're doing. And as Dr. Adamowski says, we plan on making it more robust because funding is extremely important. In order to be relevant, in order to be current, you have to have training, you have to have people coming into the building, assessing your program, you have to have coaches, and so we are still following the model, but we can always do a better job, and we are really uh, honored that Norwalk has, Norwalk believes in us, and we are looking to take something great and make it even greater. So what I'd like to do is to just give a small example of what a lesson, or what a day would look like. And so I'm gonna just walk around for a little bit. I am a classroom teacher at heart. What is this? Take a look. Does anyone know what this is? A camera? It's a camera. Very good. It's a camera. All right. Let me just cut this out. I'm going to grab my trusty markers because I'm going to pass this around because we should touch what we learned. So it's a camera. What questions do you have about this camera? Well, how does it work? How does it work? Can we all agree? A few more questions about this camera. How is it made? How is it made? Materials. Is it digital? <laughs> Is it digital? <laughs> why is there a flashlight on it? Say that again? Why is there a flashlight on it? Why is there a flashlight on it? So why is there a flashlight on it? So lead me to think that light is important. Is 
down flight. Can I make one? Can you make one? I don't know. How much does it cost? <laughs> 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 what else? Do you have a copyright on it yet? <laughs> it's falling apart. I'll take one more question. <laughs> Do we have a warranty? Because it's falling apart. <laughs> it's falling apart here on me. <laughs> One more question about this. <sighs> what if I told you the name of it is Camera Obscura? Can you explain why the image is upside down? Oh, so you're, we're activating a little prior knowledge because it seems like you know a little bit about the Camera Obscura. All right, so we have a little, we have an expert here. Well, they wouldn't call me that, but. <laughs> so what was your question again? Oh, um, can you explain why the image is upside down? Very bad. Camera obscura, what do you think this means, camera obscura? What language is that? Obscura, what does it sound like? Obscura, obscure. It's dark. Obscure. What? Dark. Dark. <coughs> and camera is yeah. Latin for? Selfie. Room. So I see something here. I see dark room. So what does dark room have to do with this camera? So I'm wondering. What else are you wondering? Two more things. What are you wondering? What do you wonder about this? Where is this camera? Oh, it's in the back. It's developed. Say that again? It gets developed it's like a Polaroid or something. Does it get developed? I don't know. How does it connect to the internet? <laughs> Internet ready? Okay. So what we would do, we would pair up, maybe get in groups, and come up with more questions about this camera obscura. We'll do that for a little bit. Where's this camera? Because the teacher might hurt me if I don't bring it back to him. Okay, now. So we have our questions, and so we're going to be researching this for the next few weeks, okay? So, now, this is an abbreviated version of what a lesson would look like, pretty crude version. So, the first grade students and the fifth grade students are going to get together and they're going to go on a field trip to the Eli Whitney Museum. First grade and fifth grade getting together to the Eli Whitney Museum. Why? They're going to be creating this camera obscura together. Now, is this just a cute little project where buddies get together to work together? No, there's a lot more to it. There's purpose behind everything that we do at Columbus Magnet School. Believe it or not, this supports our first generation science standards. So, for fifth grade, we're going to be learning about the sun, the solar system, light, how does light travel, concept of light, intensity, reflection, absorption, refraction, colors. We're going to make the abstract more concrete. And so we're going to do this together. And again, it's coming from the standards because the first grade students and the fifth grade students have to learn this. And if Dr. Adamowski can recall, when fifth grade st uh, students last year took the science test, we scored pretty highly on that test. It was a very impressive score. And it's not just about taking a textbook and reading about this, but it is the actual hands-on learning. It's making this meaningful. 
is engaging children who otherwise could care less. And so if you are a part of the learning, then you're really going to be invested in it. And so when you go to Columbus Magnet School, you might see kids in the hallway. You might hear a little more noise than usual, but it's okay because, again, it's purposeful. You're not going to see kids sitting in rows. You're not going to see kids taking information in. You're going to see kids talking. You're going to see kids debating. You're going to see kids writing. You're going to see kids researching. You're going to see kids feeling free. You're going to see them, you're going to see a certain level of engagement that you otherwise wouldn't see in a more traditional setting. No disrespect to other places, but I'm just advocating for what we do at Columbus Magnet School. Another component of what we do is our HOTS, higher order thinking, because about 20 years ago, we joined the HOTS network. And higher order thinking, what we do, we get the kids to investigate through hands-on experiences. There's a lot of inquiry and we gain multi-dimensional understanding. Children are actively engaged in their learning and they create authentic work. And so you'll never see cookie cutter at Columbus Magnet School because it's your interpretation of what you're learning, but it's always on your level. And it's not about competition, it's about you making sense of what you're learning and it's about you feeling empowered. Kids at Columbus are so happy. Kids at Columbus are so invested. Kids at Columbus and their families are so committed to the model. And it's something that I have personally experienced not only at Columbus, but at the different progressive schools that I've worked in. Again, people are clamoring in the city to be in a progressive school because people want their children to be happy. Not to say that if you're not in a progressive school, you're not happy. I've said many times before that my children were at the Marvin Elementary School and I could not have been happier. But we're different, and different is good. And so when you're living in a city, you deserve choice. You have to have choice, because it's all about choice. Columbus is not for everyone. It's perfect for my daughter. It might not be perfect for my son. I think he's happy at Nathan Hale. But it doesn't mean that I have to put him at Columbus or I have to put him at Nathan Hale. I, I, I have a choice. And so what we're trying to do here is to tell you that we need choice. And there are different choices. You're going to be learning about the IB program, which is completely different than what we do at Columbus Magnet. And I had the privilege of working at an IB school. I could tell you all about that at some other meeting because I don't want to keep you here all night long. But IB is an amazing, amazing experience as well. It's internationally renowned. And so, again, I would love for us to consider the options that you're going to be presented with because I would like for Norwalk to be a powerhouse. I would like for people to say, hey, let's move back into Norwalk because the schools are really serious. We have more choice, we have options, and we can exercise those options in a democratic society. I can go on and on and on about what we do at Columbus, but I welcome you to visit us at the school. I have our resident historian, Terry Lakin, who has been with Columbus for how long? 28. 28 years. And I have a parent here. And I have her two children somewhere in the back. And they can tell you, you don't have to listen to me, they can tell you what Columbus is all about, why people are so invested in Columbus. And so please, I practically live at the school. Call me, set up a visit, and come see what we offer. I have much more in this PowerPoint, but I would prefer to just be personal and tell you I love this school and I don't plan on going anywhere else unless my uh, bosses deem otherwise. But I'm so proud to be the principal of Columbus Magnet School and I look forward to taking great and making it greater. I do need help, I need more funds, I need more support, but I'm so proud of what we're doing so far. So I'm not going to take up any more of your time. I thank you very much for your attention. Did I render you speechless? <laughs> <laughs> We're done. We're done. <laughs> any questions? 
So I think, I think we do want to emphasize a couple of elements of the, of the model. Multi-age classrooms, K-5 emphasis on play, play is work. Uh, K-8 emphasis on social emotional learning as the school grows to, uh, to, to eighth grade. And I think um, Mr. Thomas gave a very good demonstration of an experimental, experiential learning activity uh, around which the school is, uh, is based. Can you maybe just touch on for a second from a facility perspective, one thing I really, re and I don't know if this is the appropriate time, Stephen, to have yep. this conversation, sure. but you know, I realize now when the board did vote to add 6-8 to Columbus, you know, more it seemed like, you know, Manny Rivera had kind of agreed to it and yes. Stephen wanted to honor that. You know, it was kind of came from the school. It wasn't part of some grand plan. And what I realize now, having spent you know, a year on this facilities utilization plan, was that maybe we didn't ask all the right questions and we didn't really think about it from a first, you know, we were told, okay, you know, you'd have to downsize from three sections to two because then you'd, you know, you'd have the 18 classrooms that are in the building there could work. What never crossed my mind, even though I should know better, is you know, when you get to middle school, you've got labs, you've got foreign language component, you've got different sports. We didn't talk about any of that. And you know, now these issues are kind of starting to come up that maybe we don't really have the right facilities. And I'm even thinking like, okay, if you've got two sections of each grade, that's what, 50 kids. Um, you know, what, what foreign language options are these kids gonna have? And is it just going to be one language? Are we going to have a part-time teacher? Where are they going to come from? Like, we never talked about any of those things, and so I realize now, whatever, maybe we should have thought this through a little more or figured out how we were going to implement this. I, I don't know, but it seemed like maybe whatever. But we've done it. We've made the decision. We're adding sixth grade next year. Uh, but maybe we should talk about that tonight a little Absolutely. bit. Absolutely. Um, it looks beautiful on paper. Any. No. The schedule looks great on paper. However, when you're applying it in real life, it doesn't always translate. When we found out that we were going to be a K-8, we were ecstatic because this is something Columbus parents have wanted for a very long time. When we realized that it was going to be K-8, but in the current location, then all of the air just came out of the balloon because we said, all right, we are barely able to fit K-5 in the building. Parking is a disaster. And how are we going to accommodate a K-8? How are we going to accommodate middle school students in the current structure? Columbus depends very much on um, parental involvement. We're not the school that will tell you, all right, here's the line of demarcation, do not pass it. We really need parents to come in to experience what their kids are learning and to participate. <coughs> um, we're a very strong international school, and so we welcome the diversity, we welcome the different perspectives. Um, when you're adding middle school into the mix, what you're going to do, if it's in the same facility, is to suppress parental involvement because people will pull up and not find parking and say, I don't want to deal with this and go home and not be encouraged to visit the school. And so if you want a real robust school, if you want a flagship school, and Columbus is the flagship school, then we need the facilities to support that. We have um, bi-weekly school meetings where the school gets together and we celebrate successes, we talk about our learning, and we really demonstrate that strong arts integration, that strong arts component through the HOTS, higher order thinking. And we have parents who come visit us and they watch, they are very dedicated to it because it is something special when you see your child going up and celebrating their writing through uh, poet, uh, poet, uh, their, their writing through uh, music or dance, or um, a plate. And so, you know, that again, that arts integration. So we share a space with the cafeteria and we perform, we inform, but it's very difficult when you have lunch waves and you have to wait for the lunch waves and you have to compete with um, uh, chorus and you have to compete with um, strings and orchestra. And so space is an issue and we need performing space. And so we're not being high maintenance, but we need adequate facility 
to support what we do. And so um, wherever it is, we just need more space. And so again, if you're looking for a robust K8, a flagship K8, we'll, we're there, we'll do it. But we need the space to support what we do. Thank you. Hey, Mike. Okay. Right. Thank you. Thanks Thank you very much. much. Thank you. All right, our next uh, program or model that um, is going to be presented is the International Baccalaureate Program, uh, the primary years program, which has been deemed by various uh, researchers as one of the most rigorous models in education that we have. It takes a two-year process to become an IB World School, and it's supported by the IBO using the framework of the International School uh, Curriculum Project, which is, again, international standards outside of the Common Core. The educational priority within the IV PYP, the primary years program, is developing international mindedness for its learners using the international standards. There are six key transdisciplinary themes within the PYP program. Uh, first is who we are in society. Second is how we express ourselves. Third is how we organize ourselves. Fourth, where we are in place and time. Fifth, how the world works. And sharing the planet is the last one. The PYP curriculum uh, guidelines or the principles within the curriculum process is knowledge, traditional, traditional subject areas. So these are your traditional core English language arts, math, science courses. The concepts are taught in a very structured, inquiry-based environment. In place the, the program design of the progressive model, but with an international focus. Skills is more application-based, again, with an international focus. The attitude is a mindset or a mental model shift within the IB program, where international mindedness and civic contribution is a key uh, priority within the curriculum. And action, what type of impact are you gonna have on your broader community? This multidisciplinary focus focuses on what I call this triangulation of innovation, adaptation, and also communication. Methods of pedagogy or instructional practices that you will find within a uh, IB program or IB classroom is inquiry based within all content areas. Also the Socratic seminar platform where discourse, heavy embedded discourse of focused on constructive this approach and knowledge that is really grounded by inquiry. And also the teacher role changes, it's more of a facilitation role where constructive methods are underscored within all of content areas. So it's more in the lines of this discovery exploratory uh, learning for the student. Assessment practices focuses on three key components, design, research, and application. Within an IB program, a student assessment will focus on what they call this design situation on global issues. So a student has to be able to research a global issue and come up with a situation as well as a resolution or a solution to that global issue. Design, design situation projects is enhanced by technology and digital access. So all, all uh, uh, design uh, situation projects have to be underscored within technology and they also have to have a digital component within their design situation. And to graduate from the PYP into what they call the middle years program is this culmination design situation in grade five where, it's, where there's an expedition or an exhibition where students have to display their actual design situation, whether it be in front of a panel, in front of your school governance council, whoever the whoever you think may be. Very, uh, a component that I really like about the IB program is that you have to have a FLESH program, a foreign language in the elementary school in grades K through five. So students in kindergarten have to take a world language. And also to support the implementation of the model and the program design, you have to have an IB coordinator and also a K-5 world language teacher to be able to support the FLESH program that's going to be integrated into the school. Are there any specific questions around the program design or the model of the IB primary year? <coughs> and Mike, if you could clarify, that is a, a second language instruction from kindergarten. Absolutely. Correct. Yes, correct. So the student will actually take a world language starting in kindergarten and all the way up to grade five. So essentially we want to say, if, hypothetically, if a student's taking Spanish, they will receive Spanish instruction starting in kindergarten. And it's up to us what foreign language or languages we would offer? Absolutely. You, you see a, a clear pathway or trajectory. 
heading into whether it be the CGS program at Brian McMahon High School or even broader AP uh, languages um, in, in the high school at Brian McMahon. However, if you continue to create the pathway of the primary years program, the middle years program, and already accepted into the diploma program, you have this seamless K-12 trajectory, which is very enticing. Very enticing as a parent, very enticing looking out for a community member move, trying to move into Norwalk as well. The program pragmatics of the IB program, very rigorous, very stimulating, inquiry based. Uh, students, uh, the, the, the thinking concepts or the higher order thinking skills and the critical thinking that's embedded within all content areas with this international focus, but really the assessment component, the design situation project is a high level high leverage research project where students have to engage in a global <coughs> issue that is based in this, that's current and is unpredictable solutions as well. In either the, uh, in the uh, IB program and both in, and also in a STEM or in, in Columbus, you would have certain students who need various <coughs> kinds of interventions. Correct. Would those people who are intervening, would they intervene in a particular way depending on the, over, the, the curriculum and phil philosophy of the yeah, school? To the extent possible, they would use the dominant pedagogy of the school. So, for example, uh, Reverend Simmons and I, we were at this interview um, with the uh, IB <coughs> World representatives, yeah, including, chief academic officer. including the chief academic officer who was from The Hague, mm -hmm. and these people are very well trained in the IV methodology. So basically what they do is they ask you Socratic questions, right? And if they don't think you're uh, answering it the right way, they say, what evidence do you have to support what you've just said? I mean, that's the basic pedagogy of, of IB, is Socratic questioning. Now within that, there are going to be children, as there are in every school, Tier two interventions in math and reading um, that will need some that will need tier three support, which is additional time with a, with a specialist. Um, in addition to that, we are going to have special needs students as we do in every uh, single school. And every one of these methodologies is designed to deal with a full range of students. And so it is a misnomer to think uh, because IB is considered highly rigorous that it is not something that is able to meet the needs of all students and be leveled to their needs. That's a kind of a different uh, <coughs> definition of rigor. Rigor does not mean it's harder. Rigor, rigor means you have to be more engaged or you have to be engaged at a higher level and less passive, sitting in the seat listening to, to, to do it. So the interventions will be particularized the, according to yes. the, 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 that's great. That's wonderful. Yeah. Immense scaffolding as well. Right, because you yes. want to maintain the you want those kids want to feel fully integrated into the school. And that would be that would be perfect. Um, and I guess the that, that's the the IB um, the international medical unpacking, right? But well, could you just talk a little more about just the standards and that these standards are set globally, I think, I don't know if it works down into elementary school, but I know in the high school, like, the exams are not written by the teachers, exams come from the egg, I guess, and then they're sent out to be reviewed and graded by IB Global, Is that, I don't know how far down that works. Oh, correct, and using the framework under the International Schools Curriculum Project, um, we're not, an IB school does not use the Common Core State Standards. Uh, they don't use the uh, Next Generation Science Standards. It's their own internationally benchmark uh, standards. So yes, the, the approach, the actual design, the assessment practice, the pedagogy, the thinking, um, the focus is, is different. It's a shift from American education. And my, my internal research uh, specifically states that schools that have adopted the IB program, they have the most blue ribbon schools within the United States. And also, you have seen uh, um, uh, urban districts using this as a ed reform strategy to be able to increase rigor, as well as this global approach where it's introducing new concepts to the students as well. So yes, this is a fundamental shift 
from what we're used to with the Common Core State Standards as well as the Next Generation Science Standards, but also the pedagogy is non-traditional and innovative views and Socratic approaches. Could you just repeat that again? That some di districts, some districts have used this as a way to. Is that what you were saying? Absolutely, absolutely. This has been um, the STEM, the STEM model as well as the IB model has been one of the key strategies for educational reform to um, enhance programming, enhance choice uh, within districts around the country. But the International Baccalaureate Program, um, the PYP program, the Primary Years Program, as well as the Middle Years Program has been a edge strategy. So this has been adopted you know, in urban districts, this has been adopted in suburban districts, as well as it generated the most school ribbon schools within the country. <coughs> And if I remember when they were presenting to us about IB and um, Brian McMahon, which we've accepted, um, even though we're not very familiar with it in this part of the country, there's a lot of IB, I think it was in California, Correct. Chicago. You're, within the next, um, Mr. Barbas, within the next five to 10 years, you're gonna see universities and colleges shift from focusing on advanced placement courses to if students are enrolled and graduated and successfully matriculated out of the diploma program. In high school. The, IB, the IB diploma. At the IB diploma. That's going to be weighted more than <coughs> advanced placement courses. So we think, we believe there is one other early years um, IB program in Connecticut, and I believe that is in Greenwich, is that correct? Yes, ISD, the International School at Dundee. Right, of oh, Dundee. Yeah. Right. And then there are, there are several diploma programs in different parts of the, of the state. Um, you know, I'm, we're going to talk about this a little later, but I, I think the, the great opportunity here for us given the fact that we have um, received now uh, authorization for the diploma program at Brian McMahon and this is a big step forward for our school system um, we it does position us uh, for the prospect of being able to be the only school district in Connecticut that offers uh, a an IB pathway or a k-12 uh, IB education uh, that would be something we believe that would draw people to Norwalk as a as a place to live and go to school. Is Rogers Magnet are they still in the implementation phase in Stanford? Or I don't know where they're at. I just know that they have an Ivy school in Stanford. Yeah. They they describe themselves as an international school as opposed to an, uh, an IB school. <coughs> Quick question: Where all the kids? Uh, all the kids go from here right to Brian um, Man, or would they go back to their neighborhood high school? No, they, they would, um, this, the school that's proposed, and we, we can get to the location issue in a minute, but the school that's proposed would feed to Roten, which would feed to Brighton. Yeah. Okay, even though they're out of district, they're from, let's say, East Norwalk area. Uh, yes. <laughs> There's, I think the difference already is uh, Roten is the only middle school right now that has <laughs> extra capacity, mm -hmm. so you could have a school within a school, I think is what you were saying. Yes, and that, and that ties into reducing enrollment at PONUS as well. So basically three new sections at, at Roden, three fewer sections at PONUS. And my point was, since we're putting all these kids through the IB program, we should just continue them through Brian McMahon to finish to get their diploma. Through absolutely, IB, absolutely. And not put them back to Right, that was the plan, I think. Yeah, I mean, okay. this was, I, I think in one of my uh, messages to you, I, I pointed out that this does commit the board um, seven years down yeah. the road, ten years down the road, to develop the middle grades program mm -hmm. as students would, would progress. You know, three years to build and then you have the progression of students through the, through the school. But uh, really the opportunity here is to connect this for those families that wanted their child to stay in, in, in the IP program. And our final model would be the K STEM model. And STEM has become one of the fastest and most popular educational models in the United States uh, because of the preponderance of new STEM jobs uh, within the country. It is also has become, just as part of the IB program, um, a major part of educational reform and an equity strategy in education. Uh, the curriculum design and development implementation is grounded using an interdisciplinary and applied approach. Uh, what you will see within the curriculum maps or district curriculum maps is uh, project-based learning activities and an intentional integration of the next generation science standards. Our traditional content area curriculum maps, which are ELA and math, will be underscored with science, technology, and math with full year integration. Uh, 
there was a, a, a research project that was conducted by Robert Schwartz, and the, the project was called Prosperity Prosperity, and he talked about the workplace gap. Um, work, these workplace skills are not evident within our students, but within a STEM model or STEM program design, 21st century skills are addressed in all units of study with a focus on written, oral communication, as well as collaboration. The tier one program for uh, uh, the elementary students, K through five, would be engineering in elementary, which is the leading engineering curriculum in grades one through five in the United States. I put an emphasis that there's a limited utilization of textbooks and textbook instruction, where it's more of a focus of an engineer design challenge. Uh, some of the key components, uh, foster science and engineering with technical literacy, there's a focus of having students, especially minority girls, recognizing their ability in engineering. This is what they call uh, more on the lines of this equity design, where we try to get underprivileged students as well as increasing um, girls and women representation in the field of engineering. Also, AIE units have a cross-disciplinary connection with English language arts as well as social studies and some of the key topics. Why it's not uh, integrated in kindergarten first is because the EIE model believes that building engineering literacy in kindergarten will create the foundation as well as the engagement of having students go into the engineering field. Also electricity, light, balance force, and landforms are some of the key uh, focuses or topics within the EIE program. For grades six through eight is the CPUP Lab Aids Tier 1 resource and again the emphasis will be limited utilization of textbook instruction, but also there could be a focus of life science, agricultural science, earth science, physical science, and STEM. Uh, some topics that could be covered within the 6-8 component would be uh, stream erosion, extraction, blood typing, properties of acid, and STEM concepts with an integrated math and an application of science. The methods of pedagogy, is practitioner cla practitioners in their classroom, the instructional practices will be experiential pedagogy. And the partnership to shift the mental model around the instructional practice would be with the Connecticut Science Center for professional development and professional learning. The EIE component as well as the CPUP co component, major priorities, conceptual knowledge and conceptual skill alignment. So some of the project-based activities that you would see are key research of big ideas and essential questions. 3D prototyping projects for real life experiences, <laughs> testing of science concepts, multiple testings, group collaboration with the exploration, but deep discourse as well as dialogue between groups of students. Teacher will act as a facilitator to guide the, to guide the thinking. And also the evaluation of experience, um, experiments with structured rubric boundaries. The math sequence for six to eight the ultimate goal is to have students take geometry and successfully pass geometry by grade eight. They would take either an integrated math course as well or a pre-algebra course in grade six. Grade seven would be algebra one. Eighth grade would be geometry. And also to support the implementation of this model, we would have to have a STEM coordinator. If there are any questions regarding the STEM model? I think, Steve, you had said that, that all the training and everything would be under the Connecticut Science Museum or Science, science Center. Center. The Connecticut Science Center is the training arm for experiential science in Connecticut. So there are um, two other, there would be two other K-8 STEM magnet schools in the state. One is the Annie Fisher STEM, currently exists, and uh, also the Barrow STEM which Mike has had experience with in, uh, in when he was in Wyndham. And um, there are also some other uh, elementary schools, Winthrop STEM in New London and several others and other parts of the state. All of them have been trained by the Connecticut Science Center because they have the only capacity in the state for the, uh, the pedagogy, which is the, ex the um, ex experiential uh, science methodology. Um, you do this lunch, three summers of training, so right. it's, it's a couple of weeks each summer um, over the course of, of three years. But uh, at the end of it, uh, as um, Dr. Conner pointed out, there's very little textbook use because 
Um, much of the curriculum now is translated into units of study, uh, which consist of uh, experiments, observation, drawing conclusions, applying those conclusions. It, it is the essentially the engine to apply the scientific method to the way one learns and approaches problem solving. Thank you. All right, so if, if there are no more questions on the uh, models, you know, I just, I, I would point out that, um, uh, if, you know, in the course of our investigation of this, we've gone through every um, uh, magnet school, uh, inter intra district magnet school model of the state. They're all listed on the state website. You can see them. They're not unlimited models, there's about eight of them. Uh, and some of them are not, uh, some of them are more robust than others. Uh, what we have been guided by is the need to have models that are, are uh, at, at, at robust enough that they can elevate the education of the children in the neighborhood who would be walking to the school and also attract, to be able to attract people, other families from throughout uh, the city. And um, my own view of this has been that there are three such models that can do that. Uh, one is in the International Baccalaureate. Um, um, which is the, the gold standard now uh, educationally uh, in the nation and the world. Um, the other is our own uh, Bank Street model because it's our own proven success. It's, it's uh, a school that uh, parents vie to get into and, and as the principal said, um, everyone wants to stay in. Uh, and so, you know, that is kind of our own version of uh, a model that is robust and capable of attracting uh, people to achieve racial uh, balance. And then uh, finally, uh, STEM. Um, it's, I think simply because of the preponderance of state jobs, of, of, uh, of jobs in the economy, our, our governor has said that 60% of all new jobs in Connecticut will be in STEM fields uh, in the years uh, ahead. And again, the strength of STEM is to combine content with pedagogy the experiential um, methodology with uh, science, mathematics, engineering, and technology uh, content. And uh, I think these kinds of approaches uh, do elevate our entire school system in the same way that uh, the, the IB diploma program will elevate uh, teaching and learning in our, in, in our high schools. So if there are no further questions regarding the models themselves, I'd like to spend a little bit of time with you on best fit considerations. In other words, why, why would one put one program in, in a particular place and not, and not another? Mr. Thomas got into this a little bit, but I would just like you to walk you through this for, um, for each of the uh, schools and um, kind of answer the, the why questions. The first one being, why K-8 STEM at PONUS? And, um, and why not uh, in South Norwalk or someplace uh, else? So uh, the lower school, um, which is being proposed uh, as one of the new schools to um, address our capacity needs, um, uh, replaces the Jefferson Science Magazine. And enrollment preference, and I'm, I'm referring to our comprehensive presentation of the facilities plan on the 20th and there are copies there for the public as, as well. If you didn't see this or get this, um, you may not know that uh, part of the plan for PONUS is for this new STEM magnet that the Jefferson students would have preference uh, into that school. And um, that's very important because that enables Jefferson's restoration <coughs> as a 400 student neighborhood school. Um, there is a portion of the Jefferson students that are actually in the current Columbus neighborhood south of 95, but there are another 125 students who went to Jefferson for the science magnet and are simply there after enrollment closed because it became so overcrowded. And you know, as you know, we have 620 students there for a school that has capacity of 400. And so enrollment preference for Jefferson, which means building a STEM on the opponent site, replaces and updates the old science magnet concept. 
uh, brings it into the, the 21st century, uh, but also is important in that this is the only way that we can reduce Jefferson uh, down to the size it should be, uh, get rid of the 10 portables that are currently being used there, and restore Jefferson after renovation as new uh, to a neighborhood uh, school. Now, as this was conceptualized and planned, um, I think there was every desire to do something for PONUS. And the STEM something, um, we believe, is exactly uh, what PONUS needs. Uh, PONUS would be the site of, uh, site of the sixth, uh, eight summer, uh, upper school. It would receive some renovation, but it would also receive um, some STEM facilities, it would be part of the model, the training, um, it would be a continuation of the uh, K-5 school. As you know, we've had issues with transition between 5th and 6th. Hopefully that would be mitigated in a, in a, a K-8 uh, model. But currently, PONUS has the lowest achievement in math and science in the city. Um, it is not only the lowest middle school in math and science, it is the lowest school in the city in math and science. And it is in dire need of a more effective, more robust math and science instruction. So we think that having the uh, building the K-5 STEM school on that campus, connecting it with PONUS in a K-8 STEM model uh, will benefit not only the students from Jefferson, enable Jefferson to be restored as a neighborhood uh, school, but also uh, provide the uh, assistance and, and elevation that uh, the students at PONUS uh, deserve uh, as, as well. So that's why STEM at PONUS as opposed to uh, somewhere else. Okay, so why STEM, not STEAM? Um, STEAM, uh, to all of us, you know, we say, okay, STEM in the arts, it seems to be such an attractive um, uh, model. Um, so, you know, this is, a, this is really a policy question for the Board of Education. Uh, and it, it has to be addressed relative to what the district can afford at any given time to spend in one school vis-a-vis -vis other uh, schools and children in other uh, sites. Um, the, uh, I have proposed in this budget for the first time that are given the given the commitment to choice in our strategic operating plan uh, that our magnet programs receive one thousand dollars per student for program costs for magnet program costs now the benchmark for that or the point of comparison is in our intra-district uh, state magnets uh, like uh, the center for global studies and brian mcmahon the state provides three thousand per year per student for program costs. Now, you know, we're taking a baby step at 1,000 per student, but at least it gives our schools something to work with in terms of the additional costs, program costs in a magnet, and the ability to attract parents citywide <coughs> to a program that is elevated above, um, you know, simply the, the, the bare bones regular uh, program. Um, our sense is that the cost of STEAM would far exceed the proposed $1,000 per student uh, magnet costs. And again, I, I think the board would need to think carefully about this uh, so that, you know, if we went in this direction, it would be sustainable. Um, I think the other thing that is a concern here is that we have the shortest instructional day in Fairfield County at the elementary level. Uh, if not the state. Uh, a longer school day would be necessary uh, if we were to provide students with daily instruction in reading, in math, in science, in engineering, and daily instruction in the arts. Um, and a longer school day would be very costly. This would be subject to collective bargaining with the Norwalk Federation of Teachers. And um, it is, uh, you know, as other districts have tried to extend their time, it is a very big uh, ticket item in terms of expense. Um, the arts are a current strength in our Norwood Public Schools, and there's a presumption that this can be maintained as a strength at the current level of programming and staffing at each school. So in other words, uh, you know, if PONUS and 
the new Jefferson um, STEM magnet where you have the, the current level of art, music, and PE teachers as opposed to daily instruction. Presumably, uh, we could maintain the arts as a strength in our, our, our school system. Um, finally, there are no K-5, 6-8, or K-8 STEAM programs in Connecticut at the current time to serve as models, possibly because of, of the expense. Um, there are two K-8 STEM programs in Connecticut that I mentioned, um, in Hartford and in Wyndham, and uh, in addition, several K-5 STEM programs and several 6-8 STEM middle programs. But we, don't, we don't have a Connecticut STEAM model that we can visit as we, as we can in the STEM area and model uh, those, those activities. So that is why um, we did not recommend a STEAM uh, because we were uncertain that we could achieve the conditions uh, to do it well or be able to maintain uh, and sustain the, the expense of it within a reasonable uh, financial framework. So, why the progressive model at, um, at, at Ely? So, we have the current magnet program at Columbus School. It is one of the highest achieving, the most successful, and racially balanced in the city. And uh, as the um, as, uh, principal pointed out, um, uh, has, um, I think, I believe, the, the highest uh, science scores of any elementary school, and overall, a very high achieving uh, school. Um, and it will be expanded to grade eight. Uh, it provides a high quality education opportunity to students in the immediate neighborhood while being able to continue to attract families from throughout the, the, the city. So we have a built-in school robust enough to achieve racial balance while it serves children in the quarter mile walk zone of the, of the neighborhood. The Nathaniel Ely campus provides additional space for a K-8 school. And uh, you heard Mr. Thomas talk about the, uh, the current facility. The current facility is constrained. Uh, it has a very small footprint. It can be expanded slightly, but not much. For example, you could not put the auditorium there that the school would, would, would like to have. Um, and um, you know there is simply more space for a K-8 school on the Nathan uh, Ely site, and K-8 would also maximize the grassroots tennis partnership, since students uh, from uh, I think it's third grade up through the eighth grade would be able to participate in the tennis lessons and the and the, and the tennis teams. And we are also uh, the city is also investing in expanding the number of tennis courts there, six tennis courts. We've made a commitment to build an indoor tennis court that can uh, serve as a gym uh, as, as well. Um, and um, relocating the current Columbus at Ely avoids the significant expenditure of resources on a double move that adds no value. Now what do I, what do I mean by that? Um, if we were, to, if, if, once the school is built there and Columbus moves, it is one move and it's done. And then we can renovate the current Columbus building as new for the new school, which we're recommending as the International Baccalaureate Early Years. However, if you were to renovate Columbus for, um, um, as new for the um, uh, current um, uh, progressive model, you would have to move Columbus to the new school at Ely. It would have to be there for several years. Then you'd have to move it back uh, to the newly renovated uh, building. Um, and so, um, you know, we, we view this as a, as a double move that is very expensive, very disruptive, uh, but really does not, add, uh, does not add any value. So that was behind the logic of um, having the current Columbus at Ely. Uh, I, I need to point out to you that it could be done the other way. Um, it's just more expensive, it takes longer, and it involves a double move, and we end up with a school that uh, does not quite meet the facility needs of um, the current uh, progressive block. And then finally, why the IB Early Years Program, which is a K-5 school at 46 Concord Street. So the International Baccalaureate Program represents the gold standard 
uh, in world-class education, as Dr. Connor uh, pointed out. It provides a high-quality education opportunity to students in the immediate neighborhood while being able to attract families from throughout the city necessary to achieve racial balance. Uh, the traditional architecture and limited expansion opportunities of the current Columbus building when renovated as new, better accommodate the educational specifications of the IB Early Years program. Um, the IB Early Years basically requires a traditional building. There are some uh, accoutrements. Uh, Dr. Connor mentioned the, the language classroom or, or, or language lab. Um, also, instead of a media center, uh, or a library, there's something called a learning commons that is designed a little differently. But basically, this is a program uh, that utilizes a traditional classroom uh, setting. Um, and um, the, um, the, the structure of Columbus, um, and given you know, uh, some expansion opportunity, but, but, but somewhat limited, simply lends itself better to a school that depends upon uh, a, um, a um, uh, traditional structure. Uh, the district's recent success in qualifying to offer the International Baccalaureate Diploma, which is 11-12 uh, at Brian McMahon High School, positions Norwalk to be the first school system in Connecticut to offer students and their families uh, the choice of a K-12 IB education. And so for those reasons, we felt that the best fit uh, would be at the Congress relocation. Now again, it, it, can be, it can be switched, it can be different, um, but um, you know, that, was, that was the best thinking in terms of feasibility and uh, being able to accommodate um, um, the, the needs of each program. And of course, that is in fact the, the role of the um, uh, EdSpecs committee. Uh, is to be able to provide some direction to the architect in terms of what features the school should have. And if you're working with enough space to achieve all that, or if you're working in a building uh, where the structure of the building uh, lends itself to that, um, it's, it's simply easier to, to achieve. So anyway, that's a little bit uh, more detail uh, on the thinking regarding uh, each of these uh, models and um, um, considerations relative to where they would be located. So I would just open it up to the committee's questions and then uh, we can hear further from the public. Okay. I'm, I'm going to um, reserve the right to ask questions only because I need to review probably the tape and to see what's going on before Absolutely. I can, you know, start asking some of the questions. I think several times uh, was made mention about Columbus needing auditoriums and things like that, special schools, uh, special space. Uh, so for the last 36 years, they have not been in an ideal place. Is that correct? Correct. So um, they would like to have, and, you know, again, likes, wants, yeah. maybe different than needs, yeah. right? They would like to have a room that holds uh, all 450 students so that they can have uh, frequent all school meetings. Have, they're not able to do that in their current site. Uh, is that a is that a game changer in terms of being able to have this type of school? No, it's simply a, a nice thing to have. So right now, just give me a little, little um, we're, we're talking about uh, Columbus at that Nathaniel Hilly site and the, uh, the some old resident children at the old Columbus site once it's been renovated. Is that's the, uh, the, the recommendation is for uh, Columbus at the Nathaniel Hilly site. site as a K-8 school and the um, uh, International Baccalaureate Early Years Program at uh, the 40, uh, 40, 40, 46 uh, Concord Avenue site. Now that program, the IB program, can that be at either site? Yes. 
Okay, so the some of resident children, they still have an opportunity choice to whether they want their children at that Nathan Illy site. And if we do go with the IB program or some other program, that will be at that site. Well, I think this. I, I think you're um, you're uh, uh, kind of building on Dr. Simpson or Reverend Simpson's question. Um, you could have either school at either site. Mm -hmm. That's what I want to make sure that the option is still there for. Once I review the technical of all these programs, I would probably have a lot more. Questions. I mean, the the the, the K eight school would still. Um, um, well, the, 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 the IB school, right, where it was located, would need to feed to Roten for middle school. But that could occur at, at either site. Now, it's a little bit better for Jefferson to have um, the, uh, the IB school at um, Concord Avenue because there is a, a section around the current Columbus that attends Jefferson now. And again, we're trying to reduce the population of Jefferson, but um, you know, we, we, with the magnet students alone, we could probably reduce it a couple hundred students just by giving Jefferson first preference into the K-5 STEM on the Ponus campus. I think, you know, I, I, I hope you see as board members that, you know, while we have done our level best to come up with recommendations that, you know, are aligned, that um, address several multiple needs simultaneously, um, at the end of the day, this does become a question of values and best fit and context. And there is a judgment that needs to be made by members of the board in terms of, of how best to do this in the context of our community. Question? Yeah, you mentioned before that if uh, Columbus went over to the Nathaniel Ely School, there would be one move. If, let's say they don't, let's say Ely becomes an Ely School, we still have to move Columbus out to renovate Correct. that school and then move them back. Correct. So that would be the two moves. Yeah, so they would have to, they would have, you'd have to build at Nathan Ely yeah. for, uh, for an IB school. Um, you'd have to put Columbus there. They would just make the best of it for uh, a couple of years, you know, while the renovation yeah. is new occurred on Concord Avenue. Then they would have to be moved uh, back. Yeah. Um, I have had some experience in other places moving schools. It's a very, very expensive undertaking and very time consuming. Uh, undertaking and people lose a lot of instructional time just adjusting and getting used to uh, a new environment and getting it set up and getting it getting the kinks worked out and then you know they move back and they, back. And, they and they do the same thing so you know if, if that can be avoided it's it's um, it's um, it would be desirable but again um, I think you have to weigh that against other other factors at our last board me meeting, um, board member Eval mentioned that the possibility of ponus or something. Um, have, have, any, did, have anyone explored that type of possibility? Because he said maybe you can put them at ponus instead of you know doing all this. Um, no, the the uh, I think the issue there was whether or not Jefferson um, or a part of Jefferson um, uh, of the um, of the neighborhood school at Jefferson. Would have would need swing space when that renovation as new is done. So we've got about 200 kids in portables at Jefferson now, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so let's assume that uh, by giving the Jefferson students first preference to the K-5 magnet, um, that you know that enro that over enrollment is is relieved, right? So now the next objective is Jefferson at Jefferson is to renovate it as new because it's one of the three schools designated from your study is needing renovation is new um, and could that be done um, could that be done by maintaining the portables and having a floor of Jefferson renovated as a time at the uh, at one time right or would you have to uh, before you populate the stem magnet would you have to house a portion of Jefferson at the new building 
And we don't know the answer to that. That's really a, 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 a architectural feasibility question that would have to be determined down the road when you know, we, we got to the point of considering the renovation of, as new at Jefferson. And um, this um, process, I guess we're, we're looking at a three to five year process. So let's say that the Sono resident children, you know, uh, if, if it's five years, so regardless of, of whether it's the Nathaniel site or the Columbus site, we're talking about those kids really being in a school about five years if we go with the Columbus site. So, but if we went with Nathaniel Ely, they'll be yeah. in a school within three this years. Is a, this is a really good issue to clarify. So in general, um, the construction of a school anywhere in our state and the nation is a three-year process. Mm -hmm. So you spend one year in the design process. Uh, with the architect and that would be next year and then it's two years of construction so that's how you get to three years now in a case in the case of the two Sono schools um, whatever school went first right you're marking the three years there but in the uh, in the last year that becomes the first year of the next school that becomes a design phase so then it's two more years and that's how we get to five so it's three for the first one, five for both. I think what um, Ms. Mosby might have been referring to, Dr. Adamowski, about um, Eval Kravaker's statements was he, I was just trying to find it, but I can't find it right now, but it was, he had mentioned something about instead of using the Ely site as swing space, that somehow you would use, I think, the Ponus site as swing space? Was that it? And that, but that, was, that would delay Jefferson, right? from what I understand. Yeah. Right, because Jefferson, right. you couldn't make that move there. You know, you couldn't, that, the, initially, the Ponus K5 space would be the swing space for Jefferson's when it was being renovated. Yeah, I'm not sure there would be any advantage to that. Things. Okay. Do any other board members have questions? No, I'm. I'm just. Um, I know the IB program has been put out, but if we hear within the next couple of weeks or something, if the community comes out and they decided that they might want to, because I, I didn't hear the, the STEM presentation or the STEAM presentation, that's why I'm going to listen. But if they decide that they want a STEM or STEAM for for the children in that, uh, you know, in, in their area. Would that be something that would be considered as well on on the table? I think you, as a board, would have to consider any suggestions in the context of what would be best for the district as a whole and how it would fit into uh, this plan. Right, and then um, we got to look into the um, sustainability um, uh, effect of, of all this afterwards because, as you know, sometimes we're, we're talking about building these schools and then we don't know how the economy is and, you know, right now with this, you know, they're talking already about cutting costs on certain things, with education and all that. How do we know once we get something in place how, you know, how it's going to in the long, long term last? Well, you, you'll never know that. Uh, you haven't known that for the last 15 years when you didn't build anything. And um, so you'll never, you'll never know that. You just have to deal with it as you go along. Um, and we still have the need for enough schools to accommodate the population of students that we have now and will have in the future. But yeah. you'll, never, you'll, you'll, you'll never know this. You know, by the time you get every duck in the, in the, lined up in a row, the environment will change and it'll be some other issue. Right, that, that's, that, that's, you know, that, that's true there. Um, I know we at the last meeting we it was mentioned that Sono area is one of the is fastest growing area of, of kids and everything, and I'm hearing with this couple different models. If that's the case, then um, uh, you know wouldn't it be more feasible to put the, the children in a, in a school or you know that can expand because from from what I'm hearing is that eventually the school on Concord Avenue is going to hit a certain you know point and that's it and if we're looking at something that's going long term so now now I'm talking long term if we're looking at long term then maybe we should look at you know consideration of 
that that's the school for the long term? Well, given the population projections and the number of students being bused, ideally, you would want three schools in South Norway because you can't have neighborhood schools in South Norway and achieve racial balance. So, you know, we can, we can impact 290 students with the two schools who are now being bused uh, elsewhere by giving them first preference into uh, the two new uh, magnet schools. Under those circumstances, it would be uh, wonderful if we had a third site and, had, and could do a third school there. Um, but uh, we don't have a third site. And um, we have a site at Ponis, and we have very uh, compelling needs uh, at Jefferson. And so, you know, you, you, this is trying to strike a balance and doing as much good as we can, right? Um, uh, based upon the resources and, and circumstances available to us. But there is no, there is no third site. I mean, our, our consultants have gone through this, as you know from their presentations, uh, with a fine tooth comb. And uh, unless you were to acquire property at, at an exorbitant cost, um, this is the, these are the building sites that the city owns and that are available. One thing, uh, Julia, you maybe haven't had a chance to see in your email, but I had, I, reached, see um, I had reached out to John Ireland, you know, from Silver Petroselli, yeah. asking him some two, two, I think, pretty critical questions. Um, one is this article, you know, it's gotten a lot of press from, you know, regarding Ben Barnes from the state and, and Governor Malloy's presentation yesterday talking about, you know, reducing, you know, that too much money is being spent to build schools. And in that article in the Connecticut Mirror, they talked about Greenwich and Fairfield. And, um, you know, Ben Barnes basically said, you know, Greenwich should, should have to pay for the whole thing itself. And um, anyway, so I asked, I asked John Ireland and he responded and, and I shared this with the superintendent who then shared it with the whole board this afternoon. So. Um, I think it's a it's a good email to read. I, I'm not going to read it to the right now in, in its entirety because it's pretty long and detailed. But the gist, he made several points and basically said, "Look, you know, some of these other towns or school projects didn't really fit the parameters of what the state really wanted, versus what we're asking for completely fits the parameters in terms of we're not only having rising enrollment, which some of these other districts are not." Uh, but we are also, um, you know, we're Im improving our racial integration, racial balance by building these schools, which the state did pass legislation in 2011 that says we'll reimburse 80%. So as you know, we get 32% right now, but they on paper have said 80% will reimburse you if it really improves racial integration, racial balance. Um, and, and Greenwich did try to kind of come in under that. Um, and he, and John Ireland basically said, he goes, you know, if you have the time to delve into this uh, statute, the process that Greenwich looks like they're failing at, um, and, 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 and Fairfield, uh, it may be exactly what the legislators are looking for to fund what Norwalk is doing. So you'll read that email, you know, yeah, when you see it. So I think that's encouraging that, you know, we might even potentially, he doesn't want to promise anything, obviously, but, you know, we could do better than we're expecting from state reimbursement funding because of why we're building these schools. Yeah. I'll, um, I'll be reading it tonight. I, I also brought up... Could you, could you forward that? Oh, email? sure. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, no, we just got it this afternoon. Um, another, my other email, I said I mentioned two, was that, you know, there's been some kind of shock as to what we're spending, uh, you know, what the projected costs are. Um, this $100,000 $100, per student seat has, you know, been kind of talked about. He said also a very long response about, which I won't read here in its entirety, but he did say, he goes, look, that's the total project cost. That's not just the cost of the building. And, um, you know, we just are using these numbers conservatively. Um, and... <coughs> You know, he has said when he tries to, his national average figure, someone emailed um, me about 45, the national average is 45,000 a seat uh, versus our numbers are looking more like 100,000. He's like, well, why, you know, when, and John uh, Silver, or John Ireland said from Silver Petroselli, he goes, um, 
the perceived costs, national averages are out there, and every time I've tried to track down the details and basis for these, I wind up down a rabbit hole and do not find them to generally be credible or usable for benchmarking. So I'll send both of these to you. Can I send it to the most or the entire county council? Well, yes, but he said he'll disseminate it. Right, so perfect. Yeah, we'll make sure. Yeah, you, you send it there, I'll get yeah. it to the whole council. Okay. No problem. Perfect. Thank, Thank you, Bruce. So, um, I think unless they're the board members here. I have another meeting downstairs, which I have to go to now. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks for participating, Bruce. Um, I think then if you guys are we're ready for public comments, I know there are a lot of people here. I know some of our last <coughs> public comments ran pretty long. So um, I know uh, I've been asked by several people to set a hard time. Um, but I think you know, maybe we'll just do five minutes roughly um, so that everyone gets a chance to speak. So um, I don't think there is a sign up sheet back there. I don't know if people have signed up. Thank you. Joe? Oh, it's going out. Um, there are three speakers signed up at the moment. Oh, here's maybe more. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Um, so I will start. Um, um, our first uh, speaker will be uh, Joe Janderko. I think, Joe, you feel free to come to stand up. Joe, just uh, take a seat. No problem. Um, thank you again for allowing us to speak. Um, I think when we started this whole process, my beard was one color and I didn't have a daughter, but um, here we are tonight. Um, good evening, I'm here to speak here tonight on behalf of the teachers and students of Ponce Ridge Middle School and also as a resident of Norwalk and a new parent. I've stated at past meetings that the NFT and its members are not against change and in fact, very excited by some of the elements of the plan that have been discussed for over a year now. However, this excitement quickly turns to concern and even fear as the events of these past meetings have unfolded. On paper, these plans create change and develop a 21st century paper, or excuse me, 21st century school system, but those are on paper. I have attended every meeting, taken notes, and done my best to embrace this process on behalf of my fellow teachers, and more importantly, my current and future students. However, some decisions have been made behind closed doors with no input from the various stakeholders that would be impacted the most. I, along with much of the bonus community, are left to wonder about how these important program decisions were even made. Not one staff member, administrator, parent, or even student was asked to give the up or given the opportunity to weigh in on these specific program proposals. I remind the entire Board of Ed and Dr. Adamowski that we are here. We want to be part of the solution. The community has not been given the opportunity to weigh in on the specific merits of the bonus in Ely School program nor the opportunity to learn more about the IB program at the elementary level. The NFT helped to bring and strengthen the IB program at the high school level, and the decision to create the elementary IB program was imposed from central office in an unnecessary way. Earlier meetings focused on the strategic operating plan and briefly mentioned school construction. School construction. It is here tonight, a few short weeks before the vote to approve this plan, that the public is finally engaged. Next Monday, there's a meeting scheduled for Jefferson and Pona's families just one week before the final vote. Is this really the best we can do? We, the teachers, students, and families affected by these massive changes in policy, demand better. We expect better from our elected officials and the superintendent. The NFT will not engage in any behavior that will stall or derail this important project. We know that in education, every day counts, and we know our students are not served and our overcrowded and sometimes dilapidated buildings. Rather, we ask to become part of this decision-making process. The plans you have described are only brought to life through the passion of the teachers in the room. Our creative lessons, our passion, drive the instruction and bring classrooms alive. Our hope is that we can be included and seen as a partner rather than an antagonist. I think tonight my point was even proven when Mr. Barbas admitted that by not fully engaging the Columbus parents about their their expansion to K-8, mistakes were made. I believe the quote was, things weren't just completely thought <coughs> through. Uh, let me just correct you on that, Joe. That, that's incorrect. We made that decision based on pressure from the parents. The board didn't do its homework, not the parents. The parents forced us into that decision. But that's the point I'm making. When decisions are rushed and when decisions are pushed, things get dropped. That's where we're asking to be brought in as members of these decision-making groups. 
And remember, as the budget takes shape and decisions regarding building, staff, and program are to be made, we simply ask to be included and valued as equals. My goal here tonight is once again to ask for the transparency we deserve. Your decisions will impact an entire generation and cannot and should not be made in the vacuum of central office. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next speaker would be Joanna Cooper. I'd like to say thank you for the, to the committee and uh, to our superintendent for their work on this project and uh, for your sense of urgency. I am here because I am concerned about uh, lots of talk about delay and I think that's ridiculous. I mean this is long overdue and the union it always wants to delay and I don't believe that we need to delay. I think you've got solid models and I think that you need to move forward. And I think that there has been plenty of uh, time for community involvement. I have been involved. I've been watching. I've been following it. You've been doing an, an excellent job. And I don't know where the people who are saying that they haven't had a chance to be involved uh, are coming from because there's opportunities to watch it on video. There's been plenty of meetings. So, and there's another one tonight, and it's the same people that show up. So I don't believe that's a valid um, concern. I think that there's been plenty of opportunity. I can't stand uh, the conspiracy theory either. I don't believe that there's a conspiracy. I don't believe that all this stuff has been going on behind closed doors, and I'm frankly quite sick of it. It's always the trash that gets thrown out. We have a great superintendent that is ready to make a bold move, a move that is long overdue, and I think that you've come up with excellent models and that you need to move forward. And I am really concerned uh, about the people that want to delay the process because we're at great risk in delaying the process. The schools are already filled to capacity. We have a state grant that might um, disappear if we wait. We've just all heard that it's going to take five years. I mean, what are we supposed to delay another year? I mean, it's just, it's crazy when I hear this stuff. So that's very disturbing to me. I think we have enough information to make a decision, to make a choice. I don't think that the choices are easy. I do think that the choice to make is the choice that serves all of the district and not just one community in the district. And I am concerned about South Norwalk. I think that after hearing all of the models, I'm glad that we didn't go with the STEAM model because I thought that was a little bit too much to take on. I do love the idea of the International Baccalaureate uh, program, of course the Socratic <coughs> method. Um, I am a little concerned that it, it does go away from the Common Core because I do believe in the Common Core. The Common Core is a common body of knowledge and if you own that common body of knowledge you can consider yourself an educated person. As a long-standing Norwalk resident with a child that's been through the uh, Norwalk system, my gut instinct would tell me that probably the Bank Street model would be the best model because we have proven success in that model and uh, doing that at the Eli School. And, and that, that seems on the surface to make the most sense to me. But I do not believe we should delay. I don't believe in conspiracy theories. I'm sick of hearing about delays, okay? Unions got to get it together and they, they, they have uh, a great paycheck that they get. They, they're one of the highest paid uh, staff in the state and it's time to move. It, it, it's enough delay. And you know what? It's time for a change and we need to educate kids in a different way. Our, this is a new generation, the, the technological generation, and they do need different models. The old models aren't working for this generation. We're failing too many kids. And I do think it's a hard choice because we are not doing well in math in this entire state. So math needs to be a focus, but I think that kids, especially kids in South Norwalk, would benefit from an experiential learning model because that's the real world. And that, and that, uh, and what 
what they're doing at, at Columbus is working, it's great, and I think it's very difficult to move this district forward. There's always a tremendous amount of resistance. So it's probably wise to stick with what is proven, what we do well, and go for it, and have the guts to do it. And don't delay it anymore, because we'll be sitting here another 10 years from now talking about it. There's enough talk, okay? And everybody's smart enough to pick themselves up and get the job done. And that's it. So thank you for your work. And I don't want to see any more delays. I don't want to hear about any more conspiracy theories. I want to get it done for all the kids in the future. I don't have a stake in it anymore. My child is almost done. But I would like to see all of the children in Norwalk serve better uh, for the benefit of everybody. And when we improve our school system, we will improve our property values and our whole city as a result. So that's my two cents. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Our next speaker is Diane Marchal. Good evening. Good evening, Diane. <clears throat> well, indeed, you have tough decisions to make, and uh, I know that a lot of work has been put into this. I echo what some have said about keeping openness and transparency. Let's not, let's make sure that haste will not make waste, and I know that's the goal. So I ask all sides of this issue, including the union, some friends and colleagues in South Norwalk who I've worked with on various uh, issues, and the Board of Ed and the, and the Board of Ed staff, and Dr. Adamowski, to, you, I know you're under some horrible uh, numbers coming out of the, the uh, budgetary uh, discussions up in Hartford. And this is one of the things driving this sense of urgency, which I am glad we have. However, I think it's probably well worth it almost to have a weekend or an intense discussion with the parties that have had some real issues with matching curriculum to buildings and the like. But I think all parties need to come to, to compromise and cooperate and not delay ultimately. If there's any way that you could gain some kind of extension from the state, I know there are things you have to file, please try to do so, use our legislative delegation to do so, especially Senator Duff. The thing that I wanted to suggest though, I'm here mostly to talk about um, the facility side of this discussion tonight, and I looked at your guiding principles on page 21 of that packet. I wanted to suggest that some of one additional guiding principle, which has a lot to do with curriculum, is that of environmental design and green design. And it has been proven that adding natural light wherever possible adds to test scores and points. Adding renewable energy, including solar, in a much more comprehensive way than has been discussed, even as recently as last night before the City Council, that will reduce taxpayer burden, but also can be used as a wonderful student curriculum component, especially in light of STEM or STEAM. Adding energy and heating and cooling efficiencies to the curriculum in the science and math is so important. Adding real recycling, basic, bottom line recycling, I know I'm speaking with Dr. Adamowski about this. I have been trying to get just that for almost, I'm ashamed to say it, but I'm pretty stubborn, 15 to 20 years of a rotation of superintendents of schools and boards of ed, even though it might just be 50 to 100,000 in cuts, it's well worth it. It's the right thing to do. It's a state law, and kids can learn from estimating quantities, volume. It's a component of math and science. Um, I actually wanted to speak to the, the curriculum as far as STEAM. I am one of the members in the last 15 years, as I said, I'm pretty stubborn, to try to save the White Barn Theater up in the northeast corner of Norwalk. 
Some in the room may not know that Lucille Lortel, who founded this theater, she is uh, a great dame of Off-Broadway. She actually made and partnered and gave opportunities to people of color, like Joffrey Holder and the guy that wrote Fences, which is now a movie. She gave a lot, without any credit at times, of helping people of less disadvantaged people and people of color. And we plan to shortly approach, we know you've been busy with this, to approach the school district because we hope to continue her legacy and include with all the school districts, but especially Norwalk, a discussion of how the arts can help with society's ills and issues by including school programs. So that's something that's gonna be coming up pretty soon. That is why I'm sad to say that STEAM has been tossed away. I believe the arts are an important component. Now I do understand there's a fallback in that there's been support for keeping our arts programs strong in the performing arts, music, and the arts. But STEAM is becoming important now. I know a lot of you have read about it. So I guess I'm hoping that you might give it another look. And many people, especially in the arts, I just recently joined the Cultural Alliance of Fairfield County, will come and, and help you pound the pavement for money. I like the fact that there's some equity design in some of the curriculum for minority girls, but also for girls. I'm, even to this day, I'm usually in the minority as far as the environmental science that I pursue in trying to cure excuse me, environmental health problems in society, especially here in Norwalk. It's not easy being a woman in this society, but I do think whatever we do in curriculum, we better make sure that we include how women and girls can make it in society and aspire to be leaders. As this most recent um, election has shown, uh, girls and women face double standards continuously in leadership roles that they aspire to, fill, and hope for. I have some ideas for a third site. I know I have to wind up. I am not opposed to using the Ely site. I wanted just to know, can we move the existing use of that front building to some other building in town so that there could be an expanded um, site at Ely? I do think, being an environmental advocate, I'm not afraid of the wetlands being utilized or moved, but I do think open space is very important for any child. So with that, I, I leave you to your discussion, and I thank you for letting me speak. Thank you, Diane. That is all the people who had signed up. I don't know if there are any other speakers. They gave you another sheet. Jalen? What's that? They gave you yeah, he gave me two. That's everybody. Yeah. Um, so my name is Jalen C. I just had um, a few questions and then a statement um, just about the SIM and the IB um, programs. Um, are the communities that's choosing them as models, are those programs being, any of them being discontinued? And if so, why? And um, how much did financial sustainability affect the success of those programs? Uh, now that we're aware of, well, I don't believe many has been discontinued, the number of IB schools keeps growing. Uh, within our state and nationally. Um, sustainability is an important concept. And, um, you know, as I've mentioned, um, I have recommended to, that the Board of Education provide $1,000 per student for program costs for any magnet, because otherwise you can't have, really, you can't have a magnet program. And so, um, you know, our hope is that within that amount of money, and perhaps it would have to be increased in the future, um, <coughs> that these programs could be sustainable. And that was one of the concerns regarding STEAM, that it was so expensive that it may not uh, be sustainable for the, for, the, for the future. But again, these are policy decisions of the board. And I think that um, from our uh, concern as a staff, uh, as educators, and from your, uh, in the community, um, you want to be assured of sustainability so we don't start something and then have to end it. Okay, and um, yeah, that was my question. 
Um, one of the things I just want to speak on, and I, I've been hearing it a lot when it comes to this issue, is um, they're not the only community, um, and you want to deal with the whole community. Um, but the black community is a part of the community, and we're here, and one of the biggest issues that we've been facing is the achievement gap. And that's one of the biggest things why we're fighting so hard to make sure that this is done right and done in a way where we can start to close that achievement gap. And I know that's a part of your plan and that's something that you have been working for. But that's why we kind of want to slow down the process and make sure that all of our questions are answered and that things don't fall down the crack because a lot of times we're the ones that's falling down the crack. Um, and we don't want that to happen anymore. So um, when people make comments like they're not the only ones here, we are here. We might not, not be the only ones here, but we are here. And um, just like Black Lives Matter, Black Kids Education Matter, and we want to make sure that we continue to fight for that. Um, so that's just my comment. Um, it's something that I hope that you guys just continue to be mindful of. We're on the same page. Thank you, Judy. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah's Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I just wanted to um, <coughs> say that um, I think a lot of the frustration in the black community comes from, for so many years, black people have been coming up to the Board of Ed complaining about teachers, what goes on in the school. And for years, nothing ever got done. It's always was kind of swept under the rug. So when people talk about conspiracy theories and all this, no, we have a reason to have a whole bunch of theories. And even people that even have worked for the Board of Ed, who sat back and did nothing, to show that if people in the community on the staff of schools are doing things that are wrong, that they have to answer just like anybody else does for their job. So if it's a lack of trust of people wanting to slow down and, and they're, they're skeptical of what you're doing and all that, it's very good reason. There's so much has been going on in our public school system that has been horrible, deployable, for the way students and parents have been treated for years, for a very long time. And there was never no ramification, no justice has ever been done when people came and even wrote complaints, made complaints. It was all, everything was swept under the rug. So it does create a lot of distrust. And the, People are trying to reach out the best they can. If you don't get a lot of involvement, it's because of the way they've been treated over the years for so long. So it's not a conspiracy theory. This is real. This is real to the community. It's real to us. And maybe somebody should be listening when people do cry out instead of turning a blind eye and pretending not to hear their cries. Listen to them. Because something, there's no way that if your staff is doing something completely wrong and working, you know, we talk about closing the gap, but they're doing things to create that gap, something should be done. Now, I personally look at it that it's probably systematic all over this country, not just in Connecticut, all over the country. But when people do bring it out to show that there is injustice and wrong being done within the school system, if people are gonna take the time to write you letters, come up and voice and say what's wrong and what's going on, but nobody acknowledges it, it's just gonna forever be such a distrust. I think it's very good that busing might stop and, and kids that live in South Mall can now participate in South Mall Walk, because that's where they live. That's where they grow up and they know. But I think a lot of distrust stems from that when things are going wrong, and people do come and complain, there is no action that is being taken to resolve it. Or so we have not seen. Same, it's, it's business as usual. Business as usual. These same teachers that have caused havoc are still there. These same principals that have caused havoc are still there. The same staff that has caused havoc is still there. And nothing has ever been done. So don't get mad at the people when they come and they're skeptical and they're like, well, what are you doing? You're moving too fast. What do you mean? What's going on? You know, it's real what they're feeling and seeing. Because I happen to be one of those parents. My children are grown. I have a grandson now in the school district. But 
it, but if I brought my children here today, the stories they would tell you, even though as adults, it was a horrible experience coming here and growing up here and all going through, through their school system. And maybe one day I'll convince them to come up here <laughs> and give their story so somebody can believe. But I'm just saying that it's not a conspiracy theory. People have a reason that they feel the way they do. And if nobody is never going to acknowledge when things are wrong, things are array, and the people are acting crazy, within your school, I long said, put cameras in every room. They have them for babies, for um, children in preschool. If, if the school system is not doing nothing wrong and there's nothing to be ashamed of and you know, our curriculum is what it is and everybody's being taught the same, then why don't we have surveillance in there? So nobody has to say, oh, well the teacher was right or the student was wrong. It should be surveillance in there. If it's been failing that many children for that long, something is obviously wrong. But if nobody's not gonna stand up to take the time to try to make it right and to, to really try to make it right and look at the circumstances and see it, you know, don't get frustrated when the people come and, and everybody's doubtful of believing anything you say. It's, I, all I can say is the pain is real. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Anella Savona. I'm a parent, a teacher at Columbus Magnet School, and currently in the ARC program. So I'm sorry I wasn't here at the beginning because I was in class there. So I didn't get to hear what they said about Columbus. My concern is as far as the union goes and being part of that for many years, and actually not being a steward anymore, um, is that we do want to support and, and we do want new ideas. Being a teacher that's working in the system now, and having um, my kids won't reap the rewards of seeing Columbus go back to where it was, which ironically in class today, um, we had a whole math program done with rods, which I know one of my colleagues would remember with Mequon and how it works and conceptually and abstractly for kids. That was the best teaching and that's what we used to do. Um, I'm looking forward to moving to that direction and having that autonomy. But with that said, um, and I wasn't here at the beginning, so I will ask is what's the timeline for us? Because we are talking three years from now, but as a classroom teacher now, teacher today, I have the second graders who will be the first group to be in the new school in sixth grade. But I want those second graders to know that they had the best education now. And then what are we getting as professionals? And what information? I have been to the meetings. I have always been part, if I can't be here, I'm listening or <coughs> emailing, asking questions. I'm a very passionate teacher, extremely passionate parent. I'm on the advisory committee as a parent for the high school for special ed. I agree that change needs to be made and made now but I also want to make sure that as an educator, someone with my kind of passion and the passion that these teachers have, that we are getting the proper training and the proper timeline of what's gonna happen within these next three years and, and what autonomy we would have and when that will start. Will it start in three years from now or will it start being implemented next year as we move to a sixth grade? You know, I think um, I think this is more a question of resources than autonomy, right? Um, because you know, under our student-based budget, you, you have autonomy now, right. but you only have enough money to offer a basic program right. as opposed to a magnet program that has any distinctive characteristics. So this was very evident to me becoming superintendent. You know, uh, we're looking at our our the magnets that, that we have, and they're not very robust, and we're wondering why, and we're blaming the schools and you know the fact of the matter is that no one has provided that fundamental structure and support that would enable uh, autonomy to take place at the at the school level so um, you know I've recommended in this budget to to the board uh, I certainly hope they will support it and I hope our city council will support it uh, $1,000 per student 
for and that would start for the 1718 program cost. that would start for 1718 okay. now we don't know if that's enough we know that the state um uh intra inter district magnets uh spend three thousand per year on program cost but this is a start it gives us something to work with right and i know that you and your colleagues have and and uh, you know your principal uh, as well have a very clear idea of what fidelity to this model looks like uh, because you may have done a lot of that in the past but we also um, have a realization of what today looks like but, right. and the fairness to what it is so, for our south North so North. you know i hope you will go as far as you can with with the resources that are available to you having co complete autonomy to determine you know what the what your priorities would be and again the benchmark is fidelity to the model how close can you get to that um, based upon the, the the resources that you have would we have board discussions or would it be done through governance or parent advisory of um, where that training and support as we're moving and how that's communicated to everyone? Yeah, so that's a budget allocation issue so the process for that is that um, Mr. Thomas would make a recommendation on allocation to your school governance council. Uh, they would need to approve that in the same way the Board of Education approves a uh, budget that I submit for the for the district. And then, you know, that's that's the decision. And we'll be able to share that with the community around us. So oh, absolutely. Great. Thank you so much. I appreciate the time. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you everyone for your comments. Um, it is now 902. Yep. Yeah. Okay, come on up. Good evening. I'll put my hand up for five minutes, please. You won't even have to. Okay. Um, five, five minutes would not be sufficient for me to ask the questions or make the comments um, that I've considered. Um, stakeholder involvement, from my viewpoint, is more than um, being spoon fed information with allowance for just a three minute response. Um, you heard Mr. Jan Dirk will talk about being engaged, uh, and you've heard me, for, and I'm not going to repeat a lot of what I said in the past um, uh, about what I think we really need to have done better to engage everyone. So, what I, well, maybe focus on more so important will be um, uh, some quick concerns. Jefferson School, um, how will they be engaged? What delivery efforts have been made to engage them similarly to the manner you're now attempting to engage ponies? It's a question not to answer now, but I think something for serious consideration. Uh, because at the last meeting, I heard something that I didn't know that they're gonna go back to becoming a neighborhood school. I don't know how, how well they know that and the way that things will be broken up. That I think they should be more involved. Um, more, more importantly, because I can't make all of my comments tonight, uh, and I think that's sad for me and sad for everyone else who would have, could have, and should have had an opportunity for the last year to have a lot of commentary with you as a board. However, on Monday, I emailed an invitation to uh, your chairman, Mr. Lyons. Uh, it was an invitation to Mr. Lyons, Mr. Barbers, or Dr. Adamowski to attend an education summit on this Saturday at 10 a.m. at City Hall. Uh, that summit is intended to discuss models many were presented tonight, and some of them may not have been presented, because I think we, we've not really discussed or taken a look at maybe done internally, but there hasn't been a real discussion for offices of city to determine what other options or alternatives could have been uh, available for us to see. Particularly when you look at your strategic operating plan, which talks about school choice. I think we need to have a more robust conversation about that, that assists the superintendent when he wants to get a budget that has 9% or whatever it is, he has more stakeholder buy-in to get that done. Um, because the, I, I, I'm gonna get into my comments, so I'm leaving it alone, but one thing I do know, these programs cost a lot of money. Sustainability is an issue. So I, I, I again, and I, and I brought some flyers with me, I'm giving an invitation. But is this the meeting where we're not gonna, we're not gonna shut down the community, we're gonna allow people to you know, ask whatever questions, they're probably appropriate questions that really should have been asked for you, to you as board members, or questions that you probably want to answer. All right, uh, and, and I extend this as another opportunity uh, for you to come, so I'm gonna leave these three uh, and, and hope you'll take us up on that because again, I've said this over and over again, we're not here to be adversarial, we really want to partner. Uh, from my viewpoint, this really is a part of what should have been the process that the board should have done a long time ago. 
Uh, last, I'll leave you as a point, a question that I know does need to be answered. Dr. Adamowski is looking for $1,000 in the budget for your magnet schools. Uh, you did hear a question that was asked earlier about other schools and their sustainability. I note in here that you got it for this STEM or whatever, you need to have a, a coordinator, you need to have, there's a lot of PD and all involved in there. Um, lo long term, even if it's IV down in South Norwalk, how is, and that's what I've always asked, what are we going to do to make certain in writing just as we've done in Columbus that that program is sustained forever? Because my understanding is that sometimes, uh, that I understand the district's having a real challenge doing this, and we've not had that conversation. I think this is an exciting opportunity if we really have that conversation. Uh, you'll find that we get people to get it done, but we need another year of discussion. I really believe that. Thank you, and I hope you would take me up on this invitation. I really hope you would take us up on this invitation. Um, have someone represented here. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other public speakers? If not, at 9.06, I conclude this special committee meeting between the facilities and uh, curriculum committees. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next week where we have a finance committee meeting to go over the budget on the 10th and a special board meeting to review the budget on the 12th. And we will be at Ponus Ridge Middle School to meet with their, the public and it's being hosted by their school governance council at Ponus at 7 o'clock. Many thanks. Good night.